let us pray. Our loving God and Father who art in heaven, thank you for your words this morning. Okay, so again, I am switched to the iPad, so hopefully the connection seems to be better there for you folks in Zoom land. The greatest tweets. Here are some funny tweets. I keep a baseball bat under my bed in case someone tries to break in and pitch a no hitter. Our scariest president was probably Rushmore. Because he had four heads. Fill her up, please. As I pull up my van, to the cat shelter. Wait, what do you mean Jesus loves me? Did he say something to you? Now, here's a question. <clears throat> what do these lines have in common or these tweets, what do they have in common? absolutely nothing except for the fact that they're just tweets. A tweet is a post on the social media application or platform Twitter, usually about 33 characters in length. The challenge of a tweet is to say something funny or something proactive or something profound in just a few words. Funny. Everyone says to follow your dreams. So I went back to bed. That's an example of a funny tweet. Example of a pro proactive tweet would be, everyone, every saint has a past. And every sinner has a future. And then a profound tweet would be, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Now, in just a decade, brethren, the tweet has eclipsed the essay, it has eclipsed fiction, it has eclipsed poetry to become the dominant literary form of our era. That's a line from a book called The Best American Tweets of 2019, profiled in Fast Company magazine in November 2019. You see, the tweet turns out to be a perfect vehicle for such elemental forms of human communication. For example, lamentations, angry shouts, and sharp wisecracks. That's what the tweet has turned out to be very informative form of communication and embraced by all. It is the most, or should I say, potent genre of contemporary literature today. President Donald Trump is a compulsive tweeter, sometimes sending out
down to single words such as boring. The singer Cher recently wrote, I need to shoot my phone. I don't like healthy snacks, tweeted Kathleen Chenworth. I wish I did. I no longer pretend. I love the term partner, wrote to Twitter, username cried wolves. The person then explored the word by asking, are we dating? Are we detectives on a case together? Are we cowboys? Are we cowboy detectives in a relationship? Fascinating tweets. There is no bad answer. Like it or not, the tweet has become a powerful form of communication. What if Twitter existed in the first century? Jesus might have been the greatest master of the tweet literature. Literature's most potent genre. In just a few words in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus answers a tough theological question. You see, the Pharisees gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is, or rather, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Difficult question. If you name one, you'll be accused of ignoring others. If you say they all are great, you look weak for not answering the question. Jesus could have said that all 10 of the 10 commandments were equally important. Or the book of Leviticus was the greatest expression of God's law. Or Jesus could have said that the entire Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, contained the fullness of the commandments of God. But instead, Jesus... Uh, what did he do? He gave a tweet. He gave a tweet size response. Here it is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is and first commandment. And the second is like it in verse 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, Jesus names the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God. That's a tweet, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 74 characters, the greatest tweet, the greatest tweet. Only 74 characters. Case closed. A priest and professor named David Laus, he says that Jesus names his center with his greatest of commandments. Yes, his center. Jesus is tweeting the center of his ministry. Jesus is tweeting the center of his mission. 
Jesus is treating the center of the kingdom, he has been sent to proclaim and to build. Brethren, the center is L-O-V-E, love. That's an even shorter tweet than the greatest of commandments. Just four characters, love. You see, by naming a center, Laos goes on to say that Jesus reveals something not only about himself, but also about God. Jesus is telling us, brethren, that God's law, finally and forever, is the law of love. That's the bottom line. It's that simple. And that difficult at the same time. Because loving others means putting them first. It means self-sacrificing. It means being vulnerable to the needs of those around us. And that's not easy for a lot of people to put others over themselves, isn't it? A tweet can say a lot about a person. A tweet can reveal their center. You see, for Jesus, along with the Father, the center is L-O-V-E, love. The center of God is love. The center of Jesus' his son is love. The Pharisees just scratch their heads and they ponder this, wondering what to make of it. It's amazing how Jesus turned the table. You see, they had one concept, thinking that they were going to entrap him, but Jesus somehow wiggles out of that noose, and he turned the tables on them and asked them the question, which is the greatest commandment? And then he revealed it to them. A simple tweet. You see, they knew that they had not succeeded in causing Jesus to stumble. But before they could come up with another question, Jesus asked them, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. Jesus followed up with another question. How is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Talk about a tough question. There it is. The, the Pharisees, they were completely stumped. Jesus had choked them. He had stopped them in their tracks by asking them a question. And from that point on, no one, no one dared ask Jesus any more questions. The tweet storm was over. On the other hand, it seems that Jesus asked this question just to silence his critics. He was, he was tired of their attacks and wanted to shut their mouths. We can hardly blame him. But on the other hand, Jesus was interested in establishing himself as a divinely authorized leader. He did this by showing that he knew the scriptures even better than the Pharisees knew them. In the first verse of Psalm 110, David writes, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make 
your enemies your footstool. In this case, the Lord is saying to David's Lord, sit at my right hand. Since David's Lord is the Messiah, it doesn't make any sense for David to call his own son the Lord and Messiah. So, who is David's Messiah? It's Jesus. Is Jesus, of course, the one that is simultaneously the son of David and the son of God. Jesus won this particular battle with his opponents, but he was not interested in taking a victory lap. Oh, no. Since he knew that God had sent him to be the Lord of love, he used the last days of his earthly ministry to communicate what love looked like. So he told the crowds and his disciples that the greatest, the greatest among you will be your servant, according to Matthew 23, 11. The greatest among you will be your servants. And in verse 12, all who exalt themselves will be humbled. And all who humble themselves will be exalted in the same Matthew 23 and verse 12. You Pharisees, you give tithes. You give tithes, Jesus says. But you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You have ignored justice. You have ignored mercy and faith. This is Matthew 23, 23. Come to think of it, those are some pretty good tweets. Service, humility, justice, mercy and faith. Wonderful tweets. The problem with, you see, tweeting, brethren, is that it is very easy to do. Tweeting is very easy to do. You can put a message on Twitter without having to back it up. If we're going to follow our Lord and Messiah in a life of love, we're going to have to put our words into action. If you treat it as a child of God, you're going to have to back it up with action. At a mental hospital in Washington, D.C., some years ago, the hospital chaplain was visiting a patient and telling the young woman again and again and again how much he loved her. He thought she needed to hear this and be reassured since her mental illness was very distressing and they left her as an impatient and that was very difficult. But you know what's interesting? The young woman listened to the chaplain for some time and then she pondered what he said and after she pondered it, she responded to the chaplain and she said, chaplain, chaplain, don't tell me how much you love me. Don't tell me how much you love me. First, you love me. Just show me. Just show me. Just show me and then love me. I see, we can talk that language of love as much as we want. Love by itself is an abstract. What does love mean? Love requires action. And so the woman, roses are red, volatile blue, I'll cross the wireless ocean. I will come through the snow, whatever. But then 
He says, I'll come to see you tomorrow after the rain. Very poor love, isn't it? You can tell a person how much you love them, but if you don't do anything to demonstrate that love, telling them that you love them means absolutely nothing. It's a flat love. Love requires action. It's not a young woman in the hospital, the chaplain telling her how much he loved her. She said, first love me, show me that you love me. Demonstrate it up. Telling me that you love me doesn't mean anything. And then she followed up and said, after you've done that, then she said, I'll know that God loves me too. Our tweets about love are going to sound empty unless we back them up. For the last days of his earthly ministry, Jesus remained committed to his greatest tweets. And he put it into action. Soon after offering the love commandments, he gathers his disciples, broke bread, and he shared a cup with them. He says, take, eat. This is my body. Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He shared that meal and himself out of love. Then he was arrested, flogged, and nailed to a cross. He cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last breath. Jesus gave his life. Jesus gave his body. Jesus gave his blood out of love. Action. When Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God, when he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, he's not just tweeting. No, he's giving us the center of who he is, and he is backing it up with his own life. Jesus went to the cross filled with love. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul and mind, and he loved his neighbor as himself. He loved each of us enough to die for us. That's a great tweeter right there. He loved us enough to die, and think about it. If each of you here were the last sinner on earth, think about it. Jesus would have died for you in the same manner. That is love, unconditional love, unfathomable love. We can plumb the depth of it. He gave himself. Jesus didn't just tell us that God loved us. He loved us. And that helps us to know that God loves us. When it comes to love, Jesus is not a tweeter. He's a doer. He invites us to do the very same today. And this is a day and a time in which we live. To let that love of Christ in our hearts for others let it come alive because so many people are hungry and are starving, both spiritually and physically, mentally and socially. The question is, have you loved enough? Are you loving enough to put your love, the love of God in you in action? Towards your neighbor, the stranger down the street, the person across the way, 
And that's what it requires. That we give ourselves. May God help us to recognize our great responsibility in loving others, not just in word, but in deed also. May that love beams and burns in our hearts. May we become conduits of God's love in a time when so much of what we face in the world continues to hammer at our confidence and our convictions, may we stand firm in the word of God to put it in practice, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. 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 Amen.